Not coincidentally, Cape Town was then engaged in a bid to have the peninsula around it declared a World Heritage Site in recognition of its unparalleled biodiversity. This heritage is embodied above all in something called Fambos, which is the Afrikaans word for fine bush. These small leaved evergreen plants cover the mountain uplands and the coastal forelands of the region and have come to epitomize its organic integrity and its fragile wealth producing beauty. And as it has, local people have voiced ever more anxiety that its riches are endangered by alien vegetation <coughs> that threatens to reduce it to impenetrable monotony. The blaze brought all this to a head. Efforts by botanists to cool the hysteria, to insist that fire in fables is not abnormal, had no effect. A cartoonist, casting his ironic, ironic eye on the mood of millennial anxiety, drew a flying saucer above Cape Town, this uncannily prefiguring the movie District 9, which many of you may have seen. This was some years before that was an embryonic idea in anybody's imagination. Peering down on the city, with its mountains covered with foreign flora, a little space traveler exclaims, whoop, 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 and the translation is, they seem to be having problems with aliens down here. <laughs> now, the satirist touched on a raw nerve. The obsession with alien plants gestured towards a scarcely submerged sense of civic terror. But what exactly was at stake in this mass-mediated chain of consciousness, this litany of alien nature? What does it tell us about perceived threats to the nation and its patrimony, about destabilized identities and insecure entitlements? Observers everywhere have noted that an impassioned sense of autochthony or birthright, to which alienness is the negative counterpart, has edged aside the images of belonging at the end of the 20th century. Also, that a fetishism of origins seems to be growing up the world over in opposition to the effects of laissez-faire. But why? Why at this juncture in the history of the modernist polity have boundaries and their transgression become such an urgent issue? Could it be that the public anxiety here over the invasive plant species speaks to a conundrum presently making itself felt at the very heart of nationhood in many places? In what does national integrity consist? What might polity and society mean what moral and material entitlements might it entail at a time when a global market system appears almost everywhere to be breaching sovereign borders, almost everywhere to be displacing politics as usual? In order to address these questions, and in order to make sense both of our narrative of catastrophe and the more general matter of why it is that aliens of all kinds have become such a burning preoccupation, we must take a brief detour. It takes us into the interiors of the late modern nation state. Now, Euro nations a la Benedict Anderson were founded on the fiction, often violently sustained, of cultural homogeneity. Although, to be sure, Euro nationhood was always more diverse than its historiography allows, always a work in progress. But since the late 20th century, polities everywhere have had increasingly to come to terms with difference. Historical circumstance has pushed them towards ever more diverse nationhood. Hence the growing concern with citizenship, sovereignty, multiculturalism, minority rights, and the limits of liberalism. Hence too the xenophobia that haunts heterodoxy almost everywhere, of which more in a moment. <coughs> the move towards heterodoxy is itself part of a more embracing world historical process, I would suggest, one in which 1989 figures centrally. That year, symbolically, if not substantively, heralded the political coming of age across the planet of neoliberal capitalism. While its economic roots lie much deeper, this in retrospect is typically taken to have been the juncture at which the old international order gave way to a more fluid, market-driven, electronically articulated universe. A universe in which transnational institutions grow, in which space and time is recalibrated in important ways, in which geography is rewritten in four dimensions, in which a new global jurisprudence displaces its international predecessor, overlaying the sovereignty of national legal systems, in which transnational identities, <coughs> diasporic connections, 
and the mobility of human populations transgress old frontiers, in which society has been declared dead by many theorists to be replaced by the network or the community as dominant metaphors of social connectedness, in which governance is conduced to this combination of service delivery, security provision, and fiduciary oversight, in which liberty is distilled into its postmodern essence, the right to choose, to choose identities, subjectivities, commodities, sexualities, localities, almost anything, everything else. A universe also in which old institutional forms of power, refigured now primarily in terms of biopower in the sense that Foucault uses it, disperse themselves everywhere and nowhere tangible at all, into transnational corporations and NGOs, into shadowy privatized parastatal cabals, into syndicated crime and organized religion, and into fusions of all these things. In the upshot, this state is held to be in constant crisis in many parts of the world. Its legitimacy is tested by fiscal mismanagement, debt, poverty, violence, corruption. Its executive control is perpetually pushed to the limit. And most of all, its hyphenation, the articulation that is of state to nation and nation to state, is widely under challenge. This is especially so in post-colonial nation states whose ruling regimes inherited fragmentary and fragile politics that often have to rely on theatrical means to produce state power, to conjure up national unity. Now, they are not alone in this, of course. Resource to mass-mediated ritual excess, often in the name of security or national integrity, features prominently now in the politics of states in many places. This broad historical transformation has a number of implications. For the present purposes here, I raise just three. The first is the reconfiguration of the modernist citizen subject. One implication of the changing face of nationhood, of its growing diversity, has been an explosion of identity politics, not just of ethnic and cultural politics, also the politics, among other things, of gender, sexuality, age, race, religiosity, even style. While most human beings still live as citizens in nation states, they tend often only to be conditionally citizens of nation states, which in turn puts ever more stress on this hyphenation. The more diverse nation states become, the higher of the level of abstraction at which the nation state exists, and the more dire appear to be threats to it, and the more imperative it becomes to eliminate what seems to endanger it. States, notes David Harvey, have always had to sustain a definition of the common wealth over and above sectarian concerns. One solution that has presented itself in the face of ever more assertive claims made against the name of identity is an appeal to the primacy of autochthony, to national autochthony, to the loyalties and interests and affect that flow from rootedness in a place of birth. Nor is this just a tactic, one that appeals to those in the business of government. It resonates with deeply felt popular fears and with the proclivity of citizens in many places to deflect shared anxieties onto outsiders. Autochthony is implicit in many forms of identity, of course. It also attaches to places within places and parts within wholes. But as a national claim against aliens, its mobilization appears to be growing in direct proportion to the threatened link of nation to state to the porousness of the body politics and to the seeming impotence of governments in many places to the force of external, uh, uh, face of external forces. 